here. Thanks so much for coming. I love the expo. It's an event for me, so I'm always a pleasure to give a talk. Today, I want to give a slightly different talk than I usually do. I don't want to talk just about myself, which, you know, scientists love to do that, but let's take a different approach today. I would like to introduce you to an initiative which is beyond myself and, com and comprises many researchers at Stanford. And that initiative is called Stanford Ice, and the goal of Stanford Ice is to understand the future of us. We have very modest, you know, set big goals, but, you know, just in the interest um, of having an ambitious motivation here. Why do we think this is one of the most meaningful ways to spend our time? One reason is that I think we don't think about ice sheet melting in the right way. And a good way, I think, of finding out how we think about things is just Google it, right? Just ask the internet, because the internet knows it all. So if I Google ice sheet melting, this is what you see. And one of my big goals with this talk is to convince you that that is really not a great way of thinking about ice sheet melting. Why? Let's start with the left picture. What you see here is what you want. Surface water runoff. And you see these tiny little trickles, maybe streams almost. Yeah, right. I wish that was the main problem. So let's think a little bit about scale first. Here is another way of thinking about scale. And what you see here is Yakov's Hobbit Glacier. This is from the movie Chasing Ice. I just took a part out of it. And in the interest of scale, Manhattan is on top here. And um, I should say, though, that the height of the volume is way exaggerated. The height of the ice is about two to three times that. And you see a calvin event, which basically means the breakup of a huge part of this glacier. In real time, that's about 60, 76 minutes. We speed it up in the interest of not taking the time for the rest of the day. Um, but I think it gives you a dramatic sense of what are the processes we talk about when we talk about Ashley Mountain. We're not talking about trickles of water. We're talking about something that is much, much more massive than that. And the scales here are much, much bigger than a tiny little river of surface water. So in case you thought that was impressive, let's switch to Antarctica, which is just a giant when it comes to scales. I was thinking of Antarctica change in the most fundamental way you can imagine, through data. So data is really at the core of this challenge. Here you see inside data that shows you the speed with which ice is moving towards the ocean. And one thing you notice right away is that we're not losing most of these ice from the, uh, from the outskirts, from the edges of Africa, right? One could argue that's maybe what we would expect because that's when the ice is interacting with the warm ocean. We see ice loss from the center of Africa. So if you look at this map, you see these red zones, these argue-like features. Those are called ice streams, and they transport 90% of the ice to the coast. Those are the guys that we're worried about. When we're talking about scale, let's talk about scale. Here's the cycle coast and the map of New Hampshire on top. So these streams of ice are by no means small trickles. These are basically state-sized motion of enormous ice masses. If that wasn't puzzling enough, let me remove the data layer that shows you the speed, and let's look at the subsurface. I bet, had I shown you this image first, you would have no idea of where these ice streams are. So what that basically means is we have ice moving on a clear surface, right? So there is no topography in this picture. We're looking at the bad location. We have ice moving on a planar surface. And for some reason, it creates these streams that move three orders of magnitude faster. So let's take a look at the color scale here, which you know sometimes we gloss over. That goes from one meter a year to a thousand meters a year. Why is that so puzzling? When we think about ice, we think of ice as a flow, so as a flowing liquid, which is you know, a stretch to those of you who think about liquids as coats and water. Um, so what does it mean to think about ice as a liquid? It means that you go to a glacier and you have a bunch of nails in it, you come back a year later and you see the nails have moved. So yes, the ice flows, but as you can also see from this picture, ice flows excruciatingly slowly if you let it. So this has been removed by a meter per year. So a meter per year, maybe a little bit more, is what you get out of ice. How on earth would you get that to move a thousand meters per year? It can by itself. It needs help. Where does that help come from? It comes from the subsurface. So the really, I think, meaningful insight here is that what we see in these ice streams is not ice dynamics. What we see is basal dynamics. We see the interaction between sediment and water. 
And sediment is an enormously powerful player here because sediment has this really peculiar way of changing its behavior completely depending on the water content you put in. And you're actually familiar with this phenomenon when you go to the beach and try to build a sandcastle. You have to get the water content exactly right. If it's too dry, it's just a just pile, amorphous pile. If the water content is too high, it flows. But there's this sweet spot in which sand and sediment can be very, very stable. But that means if you change the water content, you put it into sediment, you can change the behavior from completely fluid to completely solid, which is just really surprising when you think of it. No other material does that, right? You conduct as much water as one other tree or rock, it just simply won't flow out. So sediment is really special that way, and it's really influential in how it governs the dynamics of the ice sheets. Now, I'm giving you a little bit of a tour of the weirdness of ice sheets. I have not quite finished yet. So if you thought it was weird, here it gets a lot more, more weird. So what you're looking at here is the actual ice spots. And the big circles tell you where we're losing ice. So the side of the is down there. It's actually gaining ice. So it's blue, right? Blue means I'm actually gaining ice. And the radius of the circle tells you how much I gain with the scale of about 10 gigaton per year. What you'll notice is that the two glaciers that lose us almost all of the current Antarctica are here where the big question mark is. That's so called the Amos Sea. So we're losing almost all of our ice from two glaciers alone. And I think that's just an impressive testimony to how nonlinear these ice sheets are. So, you know, my background is mathematics, you do a lot of nonlinear systems, and when you do nonlinear systems, you get sooner or later you get across this butterfly effect. Right? This idea that a single butterfly could change plant. Which has always felt a little bit cerebral to me because the truth is, it's a nice idea, but most butterflies don't change the climate, right? So it, it always seems like a little bit radical. Here, I think we actually have a case in which you can convincingly demonstrate that the way that water percolates through sediment grains that can be a micrometer large control continental scale ice sheet stability, which is, I think, just a mind blowing degree of nonlinearity. Um, that I don't think we have really begun embracing yet. We see evidence of this in the field, this is what it looked like, right? So here you're looking at the base of the glacier, and you can see that these really intense shielders. So the key insight here is these streams, these arteries are circular. Those are really just a reflection of the physics that happens underneath. This is all a reflection of basal processes. Now that is very depressing in many ways, because the one part of ice sheets that we really have a hard time seeing is the subsurface, right? So how are we ever going to make progress on this, right? And I think the answer is big math. What do I mean by that? I think we need big data. Um, one of the key pieces of data that I think can really make a big contribution here is radar glaciology. One of my colleagues, Dr. Schroeder, and his group work a lot on that. Because this is a way of basically looking through the ice into the subsurface. So there is a way you can get to the subsurface. It's not perfect, but it certainly gives us an idea. But we also need big map. We need equations. We need to think about this as a multi-scale, multi-physics issue. And that requires simulations at the ground level scales. So we all have some of the work that we do in my group. We do 3D GPU-based multi-phase simulations of the granular dynamics with water input and all the drama that associate that is associated with this. We do um, an ice stream scale model and then we work with um, other researchers who work with ice sheets, ice sheet models. But just take one look at the scale you need. One of the things we do is numerics, another thing to worry a lot about is upscaling, because I'm not crossing two or three orders of magnitude I'm crossing both. So that is a uniquely challenging upscaling situation. But we need to get it right, because right now, most of the ice sheet models do not contain all of the physics we really need to understand this issue. So let me go back to my initial starting point. How do we think about ice sheet melting? So I hope that I have convinced you that the picture on the left is really such a dramatic underestimation of the scale of melting and the process that governs melting. So take it with your brain itself. How about the polar bear? Well, I mean, for one, I don't know if doesn't have polar bears, right? So, eh. second, maybe deeper issue. I think this problem is much deeper than acute polar bear challenge, no matter how adorable it is getting these feet wet, 
right? So we're talking about something way, way, way more significant as much as a lot more is. Way more significant than that. So what's a different way of thinking about Antarctica? How do I think about Antarctica? When I think about Antarctica, this is what comes to mind. So no, you're not looking at the wrong slide. This is a whiteout. So I'm not, to those of you who are mountaineers, the whiteout is basically when you get into a massive snowstorm while you're going over a snowfield. And what happens is that you have the snow and the clouds and everything just kind of creating this white and white and white. I'll leave you to imagine the howling winds and the minus 40 degrees associated with this picture. But that is how I think about Antarctica. I think about Antarctica as we have no freaking idea what's happening. And that is very uncomfortable. And in case that you're struggling with that discomfort, let me add a comment from an old friend. Uncertainty is an uncomfortable position. Uncertainty is an absurd one. And I think that's a very valuable thing to keep in mind. So I hope that this might be one way in which you can think about Antarctica in the future and, and really the need to make progress, the need to get through the whiteout and at least get some silhouettes on the picture, even though the full understanding of the physics is pretty far away. But I think we need to be thinking about these ice sheets much more in a long, non linear way than in a linear way. Now, ice sheets always, I think, always feel a little bit remote. So let's break it down just a little bit to see what that means and why I think that ice sheets are really a defining scientific problem for us. Here is an attempt to take our shift in thinking into account for California. So when you look at here are silverized projections and the curve that is labeled H++, plus plus, the purple curve, the highest one, that is the only curve that takes into account the fact that most of the melting processes are not are deeply nonlinear. So this simulation is based on the idea that the LCC, so that's the part where we have the question mark on it, will disintegrate. Only the LCC. Okay. All of the other things we assume remain stable, and I just truly hope that will be the case. Um, the other scenarios um, don't consider um, non-linearities in, in our Arctic mountain. So you can see the difference here is striking. And I think this figure is maybe a little bit unfortunate in the sense that it suggests these two worlds. Really what you're looking at is we have an enormous range of possible scenarios. So for 2100, you're either looking at um, basically three meters, or if you think in feet, 10 feet of sea level rise, versus maybe one, right? So an order of magnitude of uncertainty associated. And that's why I think the key insight for ice models is the uncertainty, it's a degree of uncertainty. And we can't wait until we figure this out. We just have to embrace the uncertainty and, and find ways to handle that. How can we do it? Um, we're working with stakeholders all across the Bay Area to think about how can we prepare for this? How can we make this uncertainty actionable? And if I had to guess, who has a shot at figuring this out, I would guess the Bay Area does, because to me it just symbolizes creativity and um, innovation in a way that not, other, not many other places on the planet do. And so I have incredible trust in the Bay Area, but also the Bay Area is not just the Golden Gate Bridge and Silicon Valley and the beautiful city. It's also this. So you see a picture from a flood in San Jose, San Jose 2017. You see a photo from the end of the era, 2014, and kids who are off school in 2013. Flooding is not an absurd future scenario. It's right here, right now. And it will stretch the fabric of the Bay Area, I think, in very profound ways. Not the big storms. We're not talking about hurricanes. What we're talking about is frequent, continuously worse flooding. And I think we better think about how we want to design the future of the day, how we want to take that into account, how can we move forward with this information in a meaningful way. So we're working with stakeholders across the bay, for example, with San Mateo County, we did a quick estimate for them, how much would be sea level rise projection change their budget in the next 20 years by basically 210%. So the numbers get big, but I don't think the numbers are the key issue here. The key issue is understanding what these floods mean for the community, for the kids who go to school, for the homeless people, for the people who struggle to drive to their job in the morning and can't because the traffic is driving because of play. So we're working to get more data on that, um, and it'd be great to get your ideas or thoughts on how we can do a better job, because I don't think we've begun understanding the real cost of these flood deaths 
what next. With that, I'd like to thank you. My name is Yang Sakala. I'm part of Stanford ICE. We're dedicated to understanding the future of ICE and I hope that I've inspired some of you to contribute to that purpose. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fascinating and a bit chilling. Uh, <laughs> um, we have time for just a couple of questions. Anyone has some burning interests, questions? Going once, going twice. Okay. Big math. Um, what new math do you think needs to be developed in order to do this? Or are all the pieces in place and it's just a matter of scaling it up? Or? No, not at all. I think the challenge here is from an ice sheet point, ice sheet modeling point of view, for example, I think the challenge is we're not solving the right equations. Right now, what we're solving is mass momentum for ice. That's not going to cut it. We need the subsurface. We need the nonlinear multiphysics of the subsurface. We need to think about granular dynamics. We need to think about upscaling. The upscaling issue is a big one for us. Um, and a lot of the common techniques used in engineering look at a smaller span of scales, right? So total is the magnitude is not a small goal there. So I think there are really challenges at each single level here. We do a lot of analytical work, working with simple models and testing them against real data. Um, so we do a lot of these sort of forward models. We need to think more about inverse models. Most of the inverse models we have for ice sheets come from a time period when data was very, very scarce. Now we're moving into a period where we have much more refined field data. But most ice sheet models have very large resolutions. I cannot use field data at the scale of individual meters in this dimension. <laughs> So I think really at all levels, the forward problem, the inverse problem, the upscaling problem, the data analysis problem, how can we do more with data sets, how can we integrate different data sets that maybe come from different years and have a different resolution. So I think big math is at the very center of all of this. Simple question. The Arctic, have you looked at that 10 years? I took that out of my talk, and my heart is bleeding because I did. Yes, we, <laughs> we think a lot about the Arctic. I think the Arctic is a very different challenge. I think the key challenge of the Arctic is that in the Arctic, climate change is interfacing with humans in a way that we have not seen in any other place on this planet, right? So the key driver, to those of you who are not deeply in attention in Arctic sort of science, the key challenge of the Arctic is that winter temperatures have gone up by up to 10 degrees in the very north of the Arctic. Just that, that number is saying then 10 degrees, right? That means that many places in the Arctic don't freeze anymore over the winter. And that's a game changer on so many levels. So the permafrost is disintegrating, we have warping roads, we have sinkholes forming, we have erosion rates of 25 meters per year in certain areas. We have basically lost all of our seeds. If any of the effects we see in the Arctic were happening in this sort of lower US states, it will be all over the news all the time. But the Arctic is a little bit more removed from our perception and hence you don't hear about it as much. But what happens in the Arctic is dramatic. And I think there are enormously interesting science questions there. And yes, we work a little bit on permafrost disintegration, it's something we started very recently, but I think it's really where climate change hits the road right now, the rubber hits the road. So I think the Arctic is it, incredibly interesting, most maybe a little bit less so from the sea level rise contribution, but a lot more so from how does climate change actually interact with us. We have a question right here. Yeah, how do you how do you collaborate with the other data sets? Like, is it like you guys are putting your own effort uh, to collect the data set, or is it something you're collaborating with somebody? And another question will be, uh, what triggered you to create a different model? When did you guys believe that existing models are not good enough and is giving a wrong impression of what's happening? Yeah, so the first question about the data, it depends on the data set. Um, if you look at, if you have um, a field campaign, like an NSF funded field campaign, you have to make all of your data publicly available. So I think pull aside is at the forefront of transparency and data acquisition. So most of those old data sets are all there for you to work with. That being said, often for models, they don't have the resolution that we need. So we work with field teams to test our models. So we right now are applying a field campaign to the LMCC to test our models with very specific field measurements. So I make a prediction for my model. If my model is right, I would expect to see X 
<laughs> and then we go there and we measure whether that's actually the case. Those campaigns are very, very expensive because the MOCC is the worst place on Earth to get to. And trust me, Antarctica has a high level, but the MOCC is really taking it to a different stage. Um, so that happens to, then in terms of, you know, other data sets that constrain, for example, the effect on the San Francisco Bay Area, we tried to work with stakeholders. We got data set on business disruptions, we got data set on flooding events, but every, anyone who has data that is potentially relevant to this, speak to me, because more data is always better. And I'd love to, like, I think we're just trying to pursue every single avenue we can, we can uh, come up with. To the other question of why do I think the models that we have are incomplete, I think that's not really a mystery. I think most people in this field would readily admit that the ice sheet models need a lot of recruitment. I mean, granted, we both been thinking about this problem for maybe 20, 30 years, right? So, of course, we didn't figure it out quite yet, partly because we don't have the data we would need. So, I think the ice sheet models are a great starting point. But in terms of actual reliable projections, they're not there, not because it's not a fault of our models, it's a fault of our understanding, right? So we only, each time we go to our data and get a field data back, it tells you that, you know, we didn't get it remotely, right? So I think our project was triggered by one of those field campaigns in which you look at the velocities, it can't possibly get ice to move this fast, the amount of concentration, the amount of nonlinearity, for example, I was, my interest in this was triggered by one of these ice streams jumping, which if you thought they were moving fast, how could this ice stream that is like this enormous, larger than New Hampshire size ice stream just jump? Like, how weird is that? Um, it makes sense when you think of it from the time scale of water, because water can be arranged in the subsurface very easily, and if the ice just follows suit, you can just jump from one location to the other. So I think it's just really the, the few field companies we have, each single one of them just kind of makes it makes us question fundamental science in just an incredibly inspiring way. And this is why I love this field, because I feel like we're raising ahead with our understanding and, and discovering a whole new way of thinking about it.